Hello and welcome to this HDB webinar examining how to improve the robustness of pest and disease control in IPM programs for ornamental crops. I'm Wayne Brough, HDB Knowledge Exchange Manager for Ornamentals and before I introduce uh, the speakers and cover the few housekeeping points I'll just say a few words about the SEPTA and SEPTA Plus programs of, of, of work as, as a bit of background. Projects were initiated to screen a wide range of uh, actives and products to assess their potential for use in, in various horticultural crops. This resulted in numerous trials over many years, uh, but it still wasn't anywhere near uh, sufficient to examine every product and crop combination. So as part of today's webinar, we'll look at uh, what's come out of a number of the trials and discuss the commercial application of the products. Uh, so just back to the housekeeping points. Um, you will see and, and, and notice that uh, you, you're all on mute throughout, uh, but please uh, don't uh, stop, don't, don't, let, don't let that stop you from asking questions. Uh, please post questions to various speakers throughout. I will keep an eye on them and ask them at the end of each uh, presentation. The actual presentation will take around about an hour in duration. It will be recorded, so if you do need to leave or share it with colleagues, it will be available uh, on the archive site on the HDB website. And there, there will be a handout basis and there also form. Well, there will be a handout as part of this, and the basis and there also forms have already been sent to you by Rachel in advance of today's uh, uh, webinar. So, just a, a few things about the functionality of, of GoToWebinar. Uh, you should have something uh, reminiscent of that in the top right hand corner of your screen. If you wish to sort of close it, then click the red button with the white arrow and that minimizes the actual box. But before you do so, a couple of uh, things just to point out to you. The uh, the questions bar there, you can see with the arrow. If you click the, the arrow, it will then open uh, a, a, a box where you can pop in a question. So as I said before, please uh, submit questions throughout the webinar. I'll keep an eye on them and pose them to the, the speakers at the end. The box above that contains a handout. So if you'd like to download the handout, which accompanies today's presentations, it's got everybody's slides on it. Please do so at some point during the, during the webinar. And as I said before, the, the recordings will be made available uh, probably sometime early next week on the HDB uh, website. So today's webinar consists of uh, three presentations from three speakers. Uh, we have Jude and Dave from ADAS looking at best performing pest and disease control products for IPM programs. And then Selchuk will follow up about integrating such projects in, in, into IPM uh, programs. And as I said before, questions at the end of each, uh, at the end of each presentation. So just a few words about the actual uh, uh, presenters. Uh, Jude is well known to industry and has been an entomologist with ADAS for over 30 years. She specializes in research and consultancy on pests of ornamental crops and protected nibbles with emphasis on IPM programs and biocontrol. Dave is a plant pathologist at ADAS specializing in ornamentals and protected edibles. Uh, specific research areas include pathogen biology and control and site hygiene and biosecurity. Uh, Dave has also managed a number of projects actually within the SEPTA Plus program of work. Selchuk is known uh, to the industry having, having uh, started his career at Derby Nursery Stock as a technical manager before becoming a consultant and then moving on to Certis as their IPM manager. He's now back as a consultant offering ICM sustainable solutions. So if, if I can now ask all the speakers apart from Jude just to make sure that their webcams and their microphones are off, I will now pass over to Jude uh, to continue with the first presentation about pest performing pest control products for IPM programs. Thank you, Jude. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks, Wayne. So I'm going to be talking about the best performing pest control products for IPM programs. And I'm going to um, be drawing on three AHDB projects, Sector Plus, Amber, and the MOPS program that we completed a few years ago. And I'm going to be talking about three pests, Western flower strips, aphids, and leafhoppers. 
So starting off with western flower strips, which as you all know is a major pest of many protected ornamentals, it damages the plants both by direct feeding damage and by transmitting. It can transmit tospoviruses such as tomato spotted wilt virus. It's resistant to many chemical plant protection products, so IPM is key to control really. So how can we integrate products into our IPM programmes? So I'd like to start off with a Scepter Plus trial we completed a couple of years ago on verbena, when azotin, that's azadiractin, was the most effective product. Azotin is a botanical biopesticide made from extract from the neem tree. It's approved for use on permanently protected ornamentals for strips control now. It's an insect growth regulator, so it stops the young larvae molting into older stages. It also acts as an antifeedant and it works on ingestion, so when the pest feeds on treated plant tissue. It's partially systemic on some host plants and on some pests, but not all of them. We applied it as recommended four times at seven day intervals and we started at the first sign of flower damage. And it was very effective. It gave over 90% reduction in Western flower strips, adults and larvae per flower 14, 21 and 28 days after first application and gave up to 81% reduction in percentage flower area damaged. So how to get the best from, from Azotin for Western flower strips control? Obviously follow the label recommendations. Do use it as an IPM programme as a backup to your biological control agents for strips. Don't rely on it on its own. It's recommended to be applied four times at seven day intervals with a maximum of 20 sprays per year in five blocks of four sprays with each block separated by 42 days. It is IPM friendly, it's safe or only slightly harmful to your biocontrols. In the same Verbena trial, we also tested another botanical biopesticide, Majestic, which is exactly the same product as Eradicote. It's made from maltodextrin and it's approved for use on all edible and non-edible crops, but not for thrips control. It's approved on the label for spider mite and whitefly control. So we wanted to test how effective it was against thrips. It has a fast contact action. It actually suffocates the pest that it has hit with the spray within two to four hours of application. We applied it as recommended by the manufacturer seven times at four day intervals. It was actually as effective as azotin was on days 14 and 21 in reducing numbers of adults and larvae. But at the end of the trial on day 28, when strips numbers were really increasing, it wasn't effective. So this one, don't expect it to knock back very high numbers of strips. Use it at lower strips numbers if you need to. So how to get the best from Majestic? Follow the label recommendations for spider mite and white fly control and you will get some incidental control of strips. Again, use it as part of an IPM programme. It's safe to your biocontrols once the spray residue has dried. It might kill some fragile little beneficials like these aphid parasitoids, but once it's dry, it's okay. It's recommended to be applied twice, four to seven days apart and repeat as needed. It's got no maximum number of applications. This is about the only product I would recommend to use in hot, dry conditions because it is more effective in those conditions. Um, it does need good coverage because it acts on contact. And finally, in the same trial, we also tested another botanical biopesticide flipper, which is made from fatty acids. Um, this has got two emus for use on ornamentals, one on permanently protection and one on outdoor ornamentals or tunnel grown ornamentals. Again, it's contact in action. We applied it as recommended four times at seven day intervals. It was as effective as azotin and majestic on days 14 and 21. But just like Majestic, at the end of the trial on day 28, it wasn't effective. So again, this is one for using at low numbers of strips. Don't expect it to be effective against very high numbers. So how to get the best from Flipper? Follow the EMU recommendations for control of aphid, spider mite and whitefly. You won't see strips on the EMU, but it will give you some incidental control. 
use it as part of your IPM program. It might again take out some fragile little biocontrols like aphid parasitize, parasitoids at the time of application, uh, but in general it is IPM friendly. So it's recommended to be applied seven days apart with a maximum of five applications under permanent protection and a maximum of eight applications outdoors or under tunnels. This one they recommend to mix with soft water or rainwater, and because it's contact in action, you do need to get good coverage. So finally, while we're on strips, I'd like to take you through how we tested a product from the lab stage through to the research glass house and finally on a commercial nursery. So starting off in the lab, we used pot chrysanthemum as our host plant and we released Western flower strips adults to these containers and then we applied the different treatments at recommended rates and time intervals. And the most effective biopesticide was a tank mix of Botanigard and Majestic. Botanigard is an entomopathogenic fungus, it's a microbial biopesticide based on Boveria bassiana. And it gave significant kill of thrips adults three, seven and 14 days after the first treatment and led to significantly less larvae developing. It gave 32% kill of adults three days after the um, three, five, on the final date after three applications. Now you might not think that sounds very good, but I'm gonna tell you how useful that can be in an IPM program. So the next step was to test the different treatments in the glass house as a backup to our biological control agent, Neosulus cucumeris, which many of you will be using for thrips control on your nurseries. So the idea of the trial was, how can these treatments complement our biocontrols and improve thrips control. So we tested six treatments, including the tank mix of Botanigard and Majestic. And this was the result. This is mean Western flower thrips larvae 14 days after the first treatment. The blue bar is the water control. You can see there were very high numbers of thrips larvae in that treatment. The green bar is the Neosulus cucumeris on its own. So you can see that on its own, it is pretty effective against thrips. But the yellow bar is where we use cucumeris together with the tank mix of Botanigard and Majestic. And you can see that that signif was significantly better than the cucumeris on its own. Um, and it reduced thrips down to almost negligible levels. And it was as effective as using cucumeris together with Actara which is no longer has an emu for use on ornamentals, but we used it in this trial as a sort of yardstick to measure how effective our treatments would be. Because at the time, a few years ago, Actara was about the only thing that would control Western flower thrips due to resistance to everything else. So the message is really, Botanigard and Majestic is very useful. It can uh, be used in IPM um, to help out our biocontrol aid. Agents. So the final step on testing Botanic Garden Majestic was testing it on a commercial nursery in the Amber project and Amber is all about how to um, help growers improve best biopesticides on their own nurseries. So we did this trial at Double H on pot chrysanthemum and the idea of the trial was to compare our Botanic Garden Majestic with the standard program the grower was using which happened to be using entomopathogenic nematodes, Steinonema feltii, twice a week. And uh, we used Botanigarda Majestic once a week. Because it was a commercial nursery, we weren't allowed to have an untreated control. Um, we applied both treatments just after blackout using the automatic spray boom. And that was because we wanted to maintain leaf wetness for as long as possible for the nematodes to keep alive and also to keep humidity high for, for the botanigard spores to germinate and grow after they'd hit any thrips. The result at the marketing stage was western flower thrips numbers were less than one per 20 pots in both treatments. So at low western flower thrips densities the tank mix of botanigard and majestic was as effective as the grower growers nemesis program. 
So how to get the best from Botanic Guard for Western flower strips control. You won't see it on the label. It's approved for white fly control on protected ornamentals. Um, use it as part of your IPM program. It, it, it's recommended to be applied five to seven days apart with a maximum of five applications per crop, 25 per year. Start when you've got low thrips numbers, get good coverage because it is contact acting and because it's a live fungus it needs at least 70% 70 70 humidity at application and for a few hours afterwards and its optimum temperature range is 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. We used it in a tank mix with Majestic on the recommendation of the supplier uh, because they recommend that in order to kill adult white fly as well as the larval stage, the, the scales of white fly. Now we haven't tested Botanigard on its own against Western flower strips in these trials, but it could well just give the same results as the mix with Majestic. So we haven't actually tested it, so I can't really say anything about that. It is generally considered as IPM friendly and it did work very well with Cucumeris in our trials. Okay, so I'd like to move over to aphids now. Um, as you know, there's very few available aphicides on the market that are effective now, particularly against two aphids that have got resistance to many plant protection products, and that's the peach potato aphid, Mysis persici, and the melon and cotton aphid, Aphis cassipii, which have got a very wide host range on ornamentals. But we also have other aphid species as well. I'd like to start off <coughs> with some work we excuse me, we did in the MOPS program a few years ago <clears throat> and I'd like to talk about a trial Tom Pope did at Harper Adams University on the peach potato aphid on pansy. And I'd like to focus on this product, Sulfloxaflor, which is now available as the product Sequoia. At the time we coded it as code 59. Um, Tom applied it four times at seven day intervals in this trial. The blue line is the water control. The red line is the Mavento, which we used as the industry standard. And the purple line is the Sequoia, which as you can see, three weeks after the first spray, it completely eradicated the aphids. So it was very effective. Then Tom did a trial a couple of years after that against the melanin cotton aphid on Hebe in a polytunnel. Again, I'd like to focus on sulfloxaflor, that's the product Sequoia. In this trial, Tom applied it twice at seven day intervals. Again, we have the blue line, the water control. In this trial, Tom used main man as the industry standard. This is the orange line. And you can see the dark blue line, the Sequoia was as effective as main man. It's gave 94% reduction six days after the first spray and completely eradicated aphids six days after the second spray. So Sequoia is now fully approved for aphid and white fly control on permanently protected ornamentals. It's effective against aphids resistant to other products. For aphids, there's a maximum of two sprays per crop and for white fly, one spray per crop at a higher rate. It's recommended to be applied between the two leaf stage and the first flowers, and you can't handle treated crops for eight days after application. It's very quick, it's a systemic material, it acts as a nerve poison, and it acts by both contact and ingestion. So a very useful aphicide. So how to get the best from it? Do use it as an IPM, part of an IPM programme, however, it's not completely safe to all our biocontrol agents. It's harmful to parasitoids such as these aphid parasitoids and Encarsia for up to two weeks after application and can also be harmful to aureus. So it's not entirely safe in IPM. There's a maximum of two applications at least 14 days apart. It is systemic and translaminar, but do aim for good and even coverage and start when you see the first young aphids but it is safe to predatory mites. So useful one to have in the um, spray store. So finally on aphids, uh, we did a trial in the Scepter Plus programme last year here at ADAS and my colleague Elysia ran the trial. It was aimed against the melanin cotton aphid, 
aphis cassipii, but we also had a natural infestation of the peach potato aphid Mysis persici, so we were able to get information on that as well. Uh, we did it on Hebe in a polytunnel. The most effective treatment's not yet approved, so I can't really talk about that yet, but I'm hoping to be able to talk about that one later this year when it becomes approved. I'd like to focus on a new product, Eradicote Max, which is a new formulation of Eradicote or Majestic. Again, it's based on maltodextrin. It gave 52% reduction in Mises persici three days after we'd put three sprays on, um, but it didn't reduce numbers of aphids cassipii. This aphid species is covered in like a waxy covering and it is more difficult to kill with contact acting materials like Eradicote Max. Um, so this material is now approved for use on all edible and non-edible crops under permanent protection. Um, as I say, it's an improved formulation of Majestic or Eradicote. We've already talked about how to get the best out of Majestic for thrips control, so I won't repeat that now. Finally, I'd just like to touch briefly on leafhopper trial we did last year on protected herbs. Uh, my colleague Pete Seymour ran this trial. It was on the so-called sage leafhopper, which will also attack some ornamental sages as well as um, herb, say, herb sages and other herb species. Um, I'd like to focus on two products. In fact, all our treatments reduced numbers of adult leaf hoppers and reduced damage, so we were pleased with that. Again, Eradicote Max gave useful control of, um, it gave effective control of both the adult leaf hoppers and reduced the damage. And Sequoia, which we've already talked about for aphid control, also gave effective control of the adults and the damage. It wasn't quite as fast acting as Eradicote, um, but did give significant kill. Sequoia, you can't use on protected herbs, but it is approved on protected ornamentals. So in conclusion then, for Western flower thrips, azotin was our most effective treatment. Majestic and Flipper were as effective as azotin until thrips numbers increased. The Tanny Garden Majestic gave useful control of Western flower thrips in an IPM programme. For aphids, Sequoia was very fast acting and effective. Eradicote Max gave reduction of Mises persici, but not aphids cassipii. And both Sequoia and Eradicote Max were effective against leaf hoppers. So I'd just like to thank uh, everybody who um, contributed to the work I've spoken about today. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Jude. We've had quite a few questions uh, regarding your presentation, but uh, we've probably only got time for two. So can I pose a couple of quick questions to you before we move on to Dave? We've had one yeah. about uh, azotin. Uh, is there any information regarding use of azotin on poinsettia, please? Um, you mean in, in terms of crop safety? I guess I guess that's what uh, yeah I guess what, that's what the question is getting at. Yeah, I mean I I I don't know specifically about poinsettia. Simo might be able to answer that one um, from his his days in Certis, um, but I'm sorry I've got no personal experience on that. So I obviously would advise trying it on a few first before you spray the whole crop. Okay, and um, as a, as a follow-up, uh, a similar sort of question about sequoia. Any any work on sequoia with cut flower production? Do you know of? Yeah. Um, again, I'm sorry. I, I'm only aware of the trials that we've done ourselves, and we haven't done any trials on on cut flowers. So. Um, I'm sorry I can't answer that, so I would suggest that whoever answered that question go back to Fargro, who markets Sequoia, and they, they probably okay. have some experience of that. Okay, well, per perhaps this one may be more, may 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 be more in your court. Uh, Botanic Garden <laughs> Majestic work very well against thrips. Uh, do you think there may be a synergistic effect between these two products? Yeah, possibly. I mean, they, they act in different ways. I mean, all the... Um, entomopathogenic fungi tend to be more effective against the adults because in the larval stages, um, 
when the larvae molt from a small larva into a bigger larva, they can molt the spores off. Whereas majestic being contact in action should have an effect on both the adults and the larvae. So yes, it, it, it could have both an, either an additive or a synergistic effect. The mechanism is, is unclear, um, but um, certainly they, they could complement each other when used together. Thank you for that, Jude. Uh, can I now ask Dave uh, to, to begin his presentation on best performing disease control products for IPM? And just to thank Jude for her presentation on, on the pest control element. Thank you, Jude. So, Jude, if I can just ask you to close your webcam, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Wayne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Kay, and I'm a plant pathologist at ADAS, working um, across all sectors of horticulture, but um, specialising in protected edibles and ornamentals. And today I'll be talking to you about best performing disease control products for IPM programmes. Now, um, SEPTA Plus programme has been going on for several years now and it, as Jude mentioned it's um, looked at an awful lot of pests um, but it also has looked at a lot of pathology and diseases um, and this list of projects um, demonstrates which disease targets have been considered so far so we've had downy mildew, um, rust, paradry mildew, botrytis as well as looking at um, white modern spider in, in narcissus. Um, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the products which were tested in those pro projects which have been authorised or the products which are likely to be gain um, an EMU in the near future. So to date, uh, five EMUs have been authorised for ornamental crops with several more in the pipeline. I'll be talking about four which have been authorised, Trupicaresi, Prolectus, Cicadis, Ranman Top. The other is Cystain, which I won't be covering today. And then in the pipeline, I'll be discussing a biological product, a plant defense inducer, and a new SDHI. So it's easy to um, forget once these projects are finished that there is an awful lot of data that's been collected. And this is going towards products which might be a little bit further away from getting an EMU. So um, quite often it'll be a few years later before the extra products um, work their way through to being able to be used by you and getting an EMU. So going through the products um, in order, I'll start with Frupica SC. So um, one of the projects that we did for Septoplus, Plus, which I ran at Wyvale Nurseries in Hereford, was Septoplus Plus Project 32, looking at botrytis in ornamentals. And this was across various different species. Um, and it was um, done in a polytunnel. And it was the aim of this project was to uh, identify an alternative product to Rovril WP, which is Iprodione, which we lost a few years ago now. Um, this was a great product because it was really good on sensitive um, species, so it would be good to find an alternative to replace it. So Prubicaresi is a AP fungicide. The active ingredient is Mepinipirin, and it's FRAC code 9. I'm sharing the FRAC code with you just so that you can understand <clears throat> that we test an awful lot of different products. Um, when we're doing Sector Plus and different actives, we don't just focus on testing SDHI after SDHI. So these fungicides inhibit cellular pro processes such as enzyme secretion. Um, in the work in SP32, we applied this product or all the test products, 10 of them, um, four times at 10 day intervals in straight programs. Not something that you yourselves would traditionally do or be able to do with the guidance of the product label. However, we do it to really test the efficacy and also to check for the phytotoxicity. In the botrytis trials, we didn't actually get um, really good levels of botrytis until the end of the project, and unfortunately we couldn't run it any longer. However, we did get some significant differences. So uh, Frupica SC, um, when, when tested, gave us 50% reduction in botrytis severity in Heuchera. Um, but also in other SEPTA Plus programs or projects, we looked at another bot Botryotinia species, um, which is a genus which is very similar to the genus that contains Botrytis. So we can tend to draw conclusions from those two pieces of work. And it gave 80% control, which reinforces um, the effect that we saw in SP32. Um, so the EMU came out in 2019. 
and um, is an effective product. Um, it's a protectant fungicide, so please apply it preventatively when botrytis or powdery mildew is likely to develop because it's authorised for use against both of those products. Um, and it's a really useful component of a resistance management program. It is, however, limited to two applications per crop. Um, and as with all products, as Jude mentioned, you should trial it on sensitive ornamental species or varieties. Just, you know, don't go out spraying the whole thing, just check it's effective. Um, no phytotoxicity developed on the Ajuga, the Heuchera, Primula, Sedum, Babaskin, Vinca, Lavendora, and Vecchia that we tested it on. However, we did test it on two species of fern, Polystichum and Dryopteris, and we did see a small amount of damage. Um, but this damage wasn't really of a commercial concern. The, ju the just underneath the unfurling fronds, where it's the newest, youngest tissue, we saw a slight damage there. However, the plants outgrew this, but it's important to know that there was a small amount of damage. But by the time it came to sale, they were all perfectly marketable. So with any product, always follow the label or the EMU guidance. Um, this is an AP fungicide, so when you're only applying four to six botrytocides in a program, you can't apply more than two applications of AP fungicides. It's important to remember that SWITCH, which is a mixture of fludioxinil and ciprodonil, um, has ciprodonil in it, which is an AP fungicide. So it's just good to be aware of that when thinking about developing programs. And to outdoor ornamentals, um, applications can only be made between the 15th of May and 30th September, and after the first flower, immediately post trimming. So this might be a bit of a restriction for those of you who grow um, ornamentals outdoors. Moving on to the next product, Prolectus. This was also tested in SP32, and the active is fenpyrazamine. And this is a KRI fungicide, FRAC code 17, so something that's new to ornamental production. And it interferes with, with still biosynthesis in the membrane, that's, that's its activity. Its EMU allows it to be authorised for ornamentals grown outdoors under protection or under permanent protection um, with full enclosure. And it's to control botrytis, however we do know it will have an effect on powdery mildew as well. Um, and this was also investigated as an alternative to Rovrol. When we trialled it experimentally um, in SP32, it gave 55% reduction in botrytis severity on Heuchera. But again, when it was tried in the upper septoplast work against a Botryotinia species, we saw really positive 80%. So if we had been able to continue um, the SP32 project further and the disease had progressed, we, we anticipate we would have seen higher levels of control. Um, the EMU is there for you, again authorised in 2019, and it's a protectant fungicide, so it should be applied when botrytis is likely to develop. As it's a relatively new active, it can be a really valuable um, product for inclusion into your resistance management programmes. Um, however, good coverage is needed, it's contact acting, it's not systemic, so make sure that you get good um, application, but it is translaminar and it is rain fast, so it has a bit of give. Um, it's limited to three applications a crop with a one day harvest interval. And again, always trial it on sensitive ornamental varieties. We saw again, very similar low levels of phytotoxicity on the ferns that we tested, but again, later on, they'd grown out of this damage. Follow the label guidance. Um, and with these kind of fungicides, applications should not be made consecutively, but used in alternation with um, botrytoside products of different modes of action. And the label states that here that applications are limited between the 1st of March and the 30th of September, or the um, EMU, I should say. Moving on to Circadus, this was tried in two projects, um, SP32, uh, Botrytis and Ornamentals, which I've been discussing, and also SP42, White Mold and Smolder of Narcissus. Um, the active is Flexopyroxad, and this is an SDHI fungicide, it's a next generation um, SDHI fungicide, um, and these uh, interfere with, with respiration of a pathogen. Uh, so it's now authorised for use on ornamentals for the control of botrytis and powdery mildew. And um, 
it was trialled as an alternative to tracker in, in Narcissus. And this product is really, really effective. It, it's, it's very good. It reduced um, botrytis severity um, in Hucura by 70% and the severity of smolder in Narcissus by 76%. Um, and this just shows you that 76% reduction that we saw in the Narcissus trial. You had four applications, T1, T2, T3, T4, and then 14 days after T4, it still had some level of control, 76% control. So a really good product. Um, it's a protectant fungicide, as the others have been, so make sure that you use it before disease um, is likely to develop. And as I said, it's a next generation SDHI, it's translaminar, and it has long lasting action as seen by that graph. It's limited to two applications of crops, so make sure you use it at appropriate times and trial it on sensitive varieties. Again, when this was used on the ferns, we saw low levels of damage. Um, but always follow label guidance. And with SDHIs, as you know, you can only make two consecutive applications. Um, and with this product, for those of you who grow outdoors, or in temporary production, um, applications are limited between the 1st of April and the 30th of September. And I just want to add that I can't remember if it's this product or um, Prolectus, but the HDB I think is challenging um, the time interval that you can apply it um, because obviously for a lot of you that isn't much use. So um, in the future we might see the, the time that applications are limited um, for one of these products. So um, watch this space. Moving on to Roundman Top, um, Siazofamid. Um, EMU came out last year and this targets downy mildew species. Uh, up until this point, we've mainly focused on botrytis and powdery mildew. Um, it's for use in or and ornamentals grown in soil and hydroponics and protected ornamentals in temporary or permanent grown in soil and hydroponics. Uh, it's a protectant fungicide and you're allowed to do six applications per year but no more than three consecutive applications in one go and we had um, mixed results and some AHGB work so uh, there is concern over whether there is lack of sensitivity to run around top or some degree of resistance so I would say if you're using this product keep an eye out for this um, and it's just useful for you to be aware of that um, if you're planning on using it, but hopefully um, you should still get some good results, but just to be aware of that risk. Those are the products which have been authorised, and I'm just going to briefly go through three products which um, are currently um, likely to be submitted for an EMU or an EMU has already been submitted for. And so the first one is a biological product. Um, the EMU will be submitted in the spring, so in the next few months, and it's a foliar bacterial biofungicide, um, which is based on a bacillus species. So similar to Amyloex or Serenade ASO, which already exist and are available. And this product reduces the damage caused by powdery mildew. Um, it was tested in SP32 and it reduced botrytis in Heuchera by 45%. And it's important to remember in that project, we were testing straight programs. So there was no other chemistry involved. So the the biological itself um, gave, gave significant reductions, um, but you would mix that with, with conventional chemistry as well in, in a resistance management program. So, you know, you would, you would get enhanced results. This product is currently authorized for use in protected edibles or those um, permanently protected under full enclosure. And it's preventative and contact acting. So you need to make sure you get it on um, in good time. And because it's contact acting, it's vital that you achieve complete foliage coverage and you have to be careful with water volumes because they're basically um, rod-shaped bacteria they need to um, cover the full surface of the leaves and if you add extra water to the same amount of product you're just going to dilute it so please be careful when you're thinking about water volumes and application. Uh, one of the nice things about Bacterial fungicides is you can mix them with, with fungicides. In this case, you can mix them with Amistar and Karma to enhance their effect. Some of the um, fungal based biofungicides um, don't tank mix as well. So it's a benefit of these bacterial ones. 
Um, and it has a one day harvest interval, or we expect a one day harvest interval if it's in line with the current label that's um, available for protected edibles. Um, we also tested it in the um, bold and white mold trial in Narcissus. And again, just as the biological product by itself with no other chemistry, it reduced smolder by 40% or near enough and white mold by 55%. And this is an outdoor setting uh, where we haven't traditionally tested some of these products, which we consider are better suited for indoor and um, protected um, environments. But one thing I would note, which is just something to comment on, um, senescence was in line with untreated plots. One of these plots in the white square is the fourth rep of the, of the narcissus trial. One's untreated, one's the biological product. I can't tell you which one's which, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we didn't see prolonged green leaf area like we had done with the other products. Um, but either way, it is a useful component in a resistance management program, and you wouldn't be applying these products by themselves. You might, um, in a program, you combine them with other products or spray them in different places in the program to maybe prolong um, spray intervals, which would be useful. Close to harvest um, can also be useful or sale to give some added protection and also to enhance the effect of your tank mixing it of other products. The next product um, to discuss is the defense solicitor. Uh, the EMU is again similar to the last one, is to be submitted very shortly. And it's a systemic host defense in inducer based on yeast, on a yeast extract. Um, and what these do is the plant detects, it notices, you know, senses this fungus which is present, which is obviously just the extract of this yeast, and it, that bolsters and activates upregulating plant physical and biochemical defenses. Um, and it's similar activity to phytosafe, which has a different active, but um, it's, it works in the same way. Um, and I think phytosafe should already be available in ornamentals. And unlike most of the other products, this actually um, claims effectiveness against oomycetes as well as, as fungal things such as botrytis. So they've got on their, um, on the product label for where this is already authorized um, in other sectors of horticulture, um, activity against downy mildew, powdery mildew, and botrytis. But like any defense inducer, um, it is preventative, and applications must be applied at least twice um, before pathogen challenge to elicit a response. Um, you'll probably get a, a small degree with one, but two is better. Um, so you kind of have to be proactive in applying this product. And currently on the label, it says it needs to be applied at seven to 10 day intervals. But obviously if you're tank mixing with other products, you need to go by the interval that's listed on those products. And if it is authorized as an EMU um, for use in ornamentals, we expect there'll be a one day harvest interval if um, that follows in line with the label. Finally, um, Another SDHI product. So I've mentioned one earlier on, but this is another one which hopefully will be coming through. Um, the EMU has been submitted, so we're hoping um, to get this in the late spring, early summer. Um, and it's a fungicide which is currently authorized for use in powdery, against powdery mildew, sorry, in apples and pears. Um, it's broad spectrum, relatively new SDHI, like the other one I mentioned, next generation. And um, when we tested this in SP32 against the ornamental species there, it reduced botrytis um, severity on both heuchera and sedum by 75%. So it's just another useful SDHI um, product for you to have um, as an alternative, which hopefully will come through um, around the summer time. So in conclusion, um, Receptor Plus fungicide trials have demonstrated the effectiveness and also the crop safety of many different fungicides against of several target diseases. And, and today I've discussed botrytis, powdery mildew and downy mildew, but there are programs on rust as well. And to date, Prolectus, Cicadis, Fruplicaresi and Ranman Top have all gained emus and are available for use um, to you now. Um, so I suggest you know, you, you, you consider them and look how you can integrate them into your programs. However, we have got several other products which are in the pipeline, 
and that includes the microbial bacillus-based biofungicide and that defense solicitor, as well as the new SDHI, um, which are coming through. And the future, to a certain degree, as we all know, is looking more and more biological. And the use and availability of that microbial and defense solicitor will be really useful. And I think SEMA will be you know, discussing some of these and incorporating into programs in a second. But there'll be really key um, things um, to include into programs, along with chemistry, to make sure that we have the best resistance management we can, plus reduce our chemical inputs. So the SEPTA Plus program and other AHD funded projects continue to trial and identify new products and that's going to continue. And um, remember that we've got data for other products which hopefully will come through like these ones I've mentioned today in the future. So hopefully there's more to come. And the last thing I'd like to say is as these products are granted via an EMU, it's important that you do test their crop safety on sensitive species and varieties. So just, just give them a trial before you use them just to make sure that they are um, suitable and, and won't cause any issues for your crops. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the AHDB uh, for funding the work along with some um, of the agrochem companies who also support it. The host growers um, who've supported all of the work our research collaborators, it wasn't just ADAS who did this work, Stockbridge Technology Centre also were involved um, in these projects. And then my H a ADAS colleagues, uh, David Talbot, Guy Johnson, Alice Shrosbury, Callum Burgess and Ruth Durbin-Jackson. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dave. Um, I've got a, it's more of a comment rather than a question, Dave, from, from yeah. Jonathan Blackman. Uh, coming back to cicadas, he's, he's just sort of said, uh, worth noting that this product, with this product, there's a re-entry restriction uh, of 11 weeks when uh, when suitable protective clothing and gloves must be worn, and it must not be used on container crops on non-porous surfaces. So I guess just something else to bear in mind there, which yeah. slightly restricts the use of this particular product. Yeah, um, with a few of these products, unfortunately, and that's a good point on apologies for not including that. Um, there are some awkward restrictions, but as I said, hopefully some of them will be lifted. Obviously, that one is is a severe restriction, which is unlikely um, to be changing anytime soon. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thank you for that. Uh, we are slightly behind, so if if I can thank Dave for that and now move on to Selchuk, who will be giving us his thoughts on how to integrate these products into current IPM programs. Just before Selchuk starts, just to sort of say. We only have time for uh, a, 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 a two or three examples here. There are more examples in his handout, so please don't forget to download the handout uh, by the end of today's webinar. Okay, thank you, Seltruck. Over to you. Thanks, Wayne. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, well, today I will try and cover uh, very briefly on how to integrate some of these um, pest and disease control pro programs. Um, due to the shortness of time I'll try to sort of explain the complexities as much as I can but to preempt and set the scene um, obviously um, some of these products will be restricted in in some way so um, we really need to um, sort of lift our game and, and just double check where uh, each product is approved and and specific product approvals and how they fit in in various uh, crop production in ornamentals. Ornamentals are very wide, so please don't take my slides as as a given. They they are purely for guidance and and just uh, a, an example of how they can how these products mentioned by uh, Jude and and, um, and and Dave can fit in. So uh, bear with me. As I say, please check the approval statuses. Uh, as Jonathan Blackman already raised, um, it, some of these could be difficult to to implement. So without any further ado, um, before I go on to programs, um, I always feel that um, quite a um, important area for us um, sort of starts to be to to, to be uh, the cultural side of things and the monitoring. So very often when we get onto um, sort of grower premises, um, really growers should be thinking about the production planning have they how they planned it have they planned it to optimize uh, crop growth and crop health um the hygiene protocols in place 
you know, what sort of hygiene protocols uh, have you got in place? Because these are as important as the choice of, of plant protection products. Um, one other thing that I keep coming across quite regularly, particularly in protected ornamentals, uh, bottom bedding plants, the environmental management and, and um, you know, often uh, some of our exposure to the environment is, is uncontrollable, particularly on outdoors. But where we can, we really need to keep on top of it because um, often it, it's not the product that it will actually um, control the disease, is what we do to the crop. So just ask yourself, have we done everything possible to give the crop the best uh, possible start and environment to grow in? Another point there on my slide is the plant um, or crop nutritional health status. Um, we are losing a number of different actives um, very quickly and some of these changes do reflect on how we, we grow our crops. Um, but what you've got to remember is that plant protection products don't really work that effectively on already stressed crops. You know, for, for the plant protection products to work really well, you've got to have a good health status of your, of your crop. And of course, as an industry, because of um, being such a diverse crop segment with different uh, pot sizes, different situations, um, application equipment can often be um, underestimated and how we deliver those uh, plant protection products. So think about what can we do to improve our application equipment, but also some of these approval restrictions come with handling periods, et cetera. Can we optimize ourselves? Can we use uh, spray gantry spray uh, systems, for example? And again, right at the bottom, I've put monitoring. It is ever more important to keep a very close eye to our crops. And uh, lastly, it's the crop protection product uh, choice. I always go by the 80-20 rule. So 80% really of any control uh, of any pest or disease lies within what the growers do and only 20% is down to the plant protection products uh, and, the, and the choice. So uh, I think more recently we are starting to see that 20% actually declining because we we seem to sort of rely and get a lot of approvals on the biopesticides front which are um, as effective um, but is just more complex to implement and, and actually understand how to get the best out of those. So I will go on to giving you a couple of examples of some pests and diseases uh, and I'll start with Western Flower Threats Program. Um, so I'm covering really a susceptible species in a low pressure situation and um, just so we can have a visual, um, if we look at, uh, for example, a chrysanthemum crop, um, whether it's pop chrysanthemum uh, or, or any po other pot embedding uh, plant, it doesn't really matter. But each crop will come with a with a life cycle span. So if we take, for example, a 10 week uh, life cycle, um, one thing that I keep seeing is that we often leave the crop protection applications right till the very end or um, sort of when we see the the problem uh, that's when we start um, really acting on it so a bit of a fire, firefighting what we really need to do is it be more proactive so if growers haven't adopted biocontrol agents um, I'm afraid to, it, the, the, the battle with any pest and disease control it, it's going to be quite difficult so uh, it really within all crop protection programs going forward biocontrol agents should um, should be the 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 the, the fundamentals uh, of of the sustainable um, plant protection programs. So I've included those at the bottom here. Now some of these could vary. Uh, they could start literally straight after potting, or or a um, couple of weeks after potting. And whether it's a um, predatory mite or a, a um, entomopathogenic pathogenic nematode or a fungi. They really need to sort of, uh, the sooner you start incorporating incorporating them, the better. Now, um, as I said, this is really a, an example. Uh, in low um, pressure situation, um, often uh, we do start with a, a conventional uh, chemistry, uh, particularly with uh, Dynamec, where we know some of our numbers are low and possibly even uh, depending on where the crops come in and the history that the crops is assisted with. 
um, we um, tend to uh, just go with a single application of, of Dynamec uh, just here, uh, right at the very beginning, soon after potting. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, I've incorporated the four applications of Azotin. Now, the reason that we need to apply Azotin slightly later is because the label approval will specify that the um, crop canopy needs to cover the either the compost or the soil, um, so you can't physically see um, to avoid um, the, the spray actually hitting the soil. So just bear that in mind, the timing of application here is really once you have a good crop canopy and you can't see the surface of the soil or the uh, compost grow media. Okay, um, four applications are often uh, very um, sort of belt and braces approach and, and really good, uh, particularly with uh, some of our pot embedding plants where zero tolerance is expected. And of course, the beauty of azotin is that actually it gives us antifeedant uh, effect. So you may have thrips, but you may not necessarily see the damage that they do. So just be aware of that. Um, as an uh, optional sort of application, I've included Flipper or Majestic um, just straight after Dynamic. That's because um, often the um, application of Dyn Dynamic is not always very effective on adults. So do be aware that if you need to knock the um, adult population down, Flipper and or Majestic could, could be a very good option to then give you sort of two weeks later a, a, a clean start of your biocontrol agent program right here at the bottom. And as we've heard from Jude, uh, Botanigard tank mix with Majestic could also be a very effective way. Um, it will depend on whether or not you uh, um, um, are, are able to, to deliver some of the environmental conditions for the Botanigard to be effective. But certainly um, closer to um, sort of point of sale really, um, we, or, or, or dispatch of plants, we really need to be thinking of Botanigard and Majestic as, a, as an option to um, sort of um, set, send the plants out of, of, of the nursery. In terms of high pressure situation, now this is where it gets really complicated. Um, I do still recommend biocontrol uh, program alongside our conventional chemistry and the biopesticides purely because there is no resistance risk against biocontrol uh, agents. Um, they can't, pests can't stop uh, being eaten by those um, uh, biocontrol agents. So it's, it's always uh, important to have those as, as the um, bone of, of, of every pest control problem. Um, around the country in the UK, we do know that there is quite a bit of um, resistance issues with conserve or spinosat. Um, however, uh, there are still um, growers and nurseries out there that um, haven't actually resorted to conserve um, recently. So if you do get a spur of, of uh, thrips uh, influx during the season and you're in a high pressure situation, um, consecutive applications, two consecutive applications of conserve tank mix with Majestic could actually give you a very good result as I say, provided that you don't have a resistant population of Western flower thrips. Once we obviously clean up the crop uh, and continue with our biological control agents, please be aware that there is a little bit of um, um, side effect from the uh, application of conserve on our, on our biocontrol agents to allow sufficient time for um, conserve uh, residues and deposits to, to diminish to allow our biocontrol agents to establish. Um, again, following up with the four applications of azotin, one of the key areas here is uh, in a high pressure situation is to watch the um, timing between the last application of conserve and the first application of azotin. That's because if you do have an issue with resistance trips, you're likely to need another application before you kick off and clean up uh, uh, the crop. Uh, before you start with your biocontrol agents and, and the biopesticide. So uh, really crucial timing is sort of second or third week within the crop cycle to continue to monitor the effectiveness of the two consecutive applications of conserve. Um, generally speaking, again, depending on whether you're in a, in a sort of spring or autumn application, autumn uh, is usually more um, 
problematic from thrips point of view sort of august august september so um, we may need to integrate a dynamic between the first and the second application of azotin just to help out our biocontrol agents and at that time um, the the persistency of the dynamic uh, for um, as a side effect to biocontrol agents uh, could be uh, about a week or maybe a couple of weeks so again do be aware of that and uh, lastly, if we do need to knock down any adult or larvae right before dispatch, uh, think about the knockdown products of Flipper or uh, Majestic, just to give you that um, sort of cleanup spray at the end of any adults, uh, potentially. And as I've mentioned, we may need to bring Dynamic uh, slightly earlier after the consecutive applications of Conserve. Now, Conserve, uh, is recommended on the label to be made minimum of two consecutive applications. Often in the field, we don't to be we don't tend to be that um, uh, robust, that meticulous. So the, the the mistake that we often make is we apply a single application of conserve and and wait for miracles to happen. Unfortunately, we've got to let, follow the um, label guidelines. That's really important. On to F AFID program. Um, in the UK, we would have, generally speaking, two peaks of, of aphid pressure. So that's sort of early spring uh, and then uh, sort of late summer into early autumn, um, where the second sort of peak is, is slightly um, lower, the pressure is slightly lower. So the high pressure situation, sort of looking at April to June, again, very similar crop situation. Um, spring time, um, there is a lot of um, plant movement, a lot of lush growth. Um, generally speaking, that's when the systemic products work really well. Um, so starting off with Batavia, as soon as the roots have hit the side of the pots, if you're in a container grown um, uh, crop or if you're in a field crop situation, think about uh, looking at that vegetative growth. You really need sort of two to three centimeters of, of good vegetative growth before you consider application of, of Batavia. And also, as we've heard from, from Jude, Sequoia is another option here uh, just before flowering, which gives us a very, very good timing in a high pressure situation. And likewise, uh, we still have a, a main man, uh, depending on which uh, aphid species we're dealing with, together with a possible tank mix with Majestic. Again, uh, I have added um, uh, a few other um, examples uh, and options. Now, Majestic um, is, as you've heard, quite a good fast-acting knockdown product. It's mainly for use in, in sort of warmer, hotter conditions. Uh, that's when it's the most effective. So effectively, a, a summer knockdown product, really. With regards to Flipper, uh, the positioning after Batavia is really crucial because You've got to remember the, the speed of kill of Batavia could be quite slow depending on the timing of application and the sort of uh, year, the, the time of the year. Um, so um, as a systemic product, uh, Batavia is a uh, life cycle breaker, whereas Flipper is really a, a knockdown uh, product. So that's uh, uh, potentially where you could position Flipper, particularly early spring when the temperatures uh, are not quite high enough for Majestic. And likewise, um, we do have a, a, a new NIC option right at the other end, Gazelle. So do be careful if you are limited by what you can apply in terms of um, new nicotinins to your um, uh, crops by your customers. Uh, Gazelle may not be available to you because of restrictions on use of new nicotinoids. So do be aware of that. Okay, so if we look at the AFID program, but in low pressure situation, um again remembering that we're talking about sort of late summer into early august uh, sorry late summer into early autumn uh, obviously some of the vegetative gro growth would have slowed down the cell division would have almost stopped so think about incorporating majestic with main man as a start of the season start of the crop and then following up with some contact mode of actions and again the option of sequoia here as you can see um, uh, just before flowering is, is really crucial. It gives us quite a, a nice long period of, of protection all the way to uh, almost to the end of the crop. And should we see an, an influx of increase of uh, aphid 
uh, attack, we always can apply two applications of Flipper, as I say, towards the autumn is much better product working under cooler conditions. Over to the um, disease control products. Um, I'm only going to present a powdery mildew program here, uh, but in your handouts, you do have um, a couple of other slides. So please do have a look into those. And as I said, these are really uh, examples and, and guidance so we can discuss how we can build and position our products that are coming through. Powdery mildew high, high pressure situation. Um, it's really down to um, starting with a um, SDHI product. Now I've positioned Circadis here. However, as I've mentioned already, um, some of the um, restrictions might be very limiting. So do be careful, uh, but we do have other SDHIs approved here. So um, soon after potting, um, generally speaking, as I say, I would target um, sort of the timing to be similar to seeing a, a, a root starting to hit the side of the pot. Uh, that's when the SDHIs are very effective and they give us uh, quite a long period of protection. Being a powdery mildew program, um, Takumi and Nimrod are very strong uh, mildew sites. In fact, uh, these are probably the two mildew sites that um, do cover quite a wide range of uh, different powdery mildew species on our ornamental crops. And again, um, often I will be asked, um, why is my product not controlling powdery mildew? Uh, on my crop? Well, every crop comes with a different host of, of powdery mildew species, so, and not every product controls all of the powdery mildew species. So, do be careful of your product choice because um, some of the um, powdery mildew species are not controlled by uh, all of the actives. So, uh, a little bit of a heads up here uh, to do some homework. Um, Fruit picker, uh, it gives us actually quite a nice uh, slot, particularly in programs where uh, we are concerned still with uh, some botrytis issues. But fruit picker is also uh, relatively um, effective on powdery mildew and uh, it delivers that uh, safety of a mixed program of botrytis and powdery mildew if you decide to go um, uh, with, a, with a program that gives you a uh, little bit of extra security. Same with the SDHIs, they will both control, um, they will control both powdery mildew and, and botrytis as well, uh, in addition to some other um, foliar pathogens as well, like leaf spots. And again, finishing with the uh, conventional chemistry right at the end, the choice of Takuma and uh, Nimrod for high pressure situation in powdery mildew. Um, I've incorporated the new Bacillus products, uh, which Dave talked about. Um, they are actually very exciting products. Um, I am uh, very much pro Bacillus based uh, active ingredients. They are uh, really uh, interesting products because they uh, encourage uh, plant defense um, uh, mechanisms as well as have a direct impact on the pathogen. So as soon as we finish off our three applications of conventionals, it's time for us to kick off with um, Bacillus species uh, at that point. Now, um, generally speaking, around about May, June, most of you, you'll see um, a, a significant influx of, of, uh, of powdery mildew. Think about incorporating a product called Topaz and, and Karma. Again, depending on the sort of situation that you're in. And um, obviously um, some of these uh, tank mixes could have an impact on your phytotoxicity, particularly on flower petals. So please do be careful using this particular tank mix. But the reason I've put it in there is because one of the sort of strong eradicant options, really, really effective uh, in terms of um, eradicating existing um, mycelium on the, on the foliage. So Pando Mildew uh, low pressure program, um, it looks very similar. Again, starting with, with uh, Circadis, finishing off with either Takumi or Nimrod as a specific mildew site. Uh, that's really sort of where the, the, the program uh, building starts. And then we've got the uh, two applications of elicitors. Um, I have uh, used elicitors myself, and I have to say, uh, for me, that's the way forward, particularly in uh, low pressure situation in years when powdery mildew is not that prevalent. Um, 
they are very strong active ingredients. Um, often I do see even an impact from single application, um, but they are um, really effective tools of, of um, controlling and, and making sure we put a anti-resistance program in place. Um, think about elicitors as uh, jabs. I mean, there's a lot of um, talk about um, um, vaccination at the moment. Uh, one is good, two is even better. Uh, and stick to two because uh, personal experience, I mean, I, I did struggle in the past with honeysuckles, uh, the, some of the oaks and some of the rosaceae species are very difficult to control in terms of powdery mildew. Elicitors in a low pressure situation can give you a really good boost to your, your uh, crop protection programs. And again, the bacillus species, uh, as I said, they will actually uh, complement elicitors because they will also encourage the plant immune uh, system or plant defense mechanisms, in addition to actually creating a barrier uh, for the pathogens to grow in. So these are very, very effective products and it could give us a very nice option, particularly where we're starting to look at um, um, residues on ornamental. So it could be a very, um, um, of innovative approach going forward. And of course, I did include a uh, knockdown sort of SDHI uh, option here for um, just in case if you started actually seeing some mycelium developing on the leaf. So again, bearing in mind, this will be the second application of, of uh, SDHI. If you have used the product here, think about uh, perhaps using some of the um, other SDHIs just to give you a little bit of safety. Particularly, there are a couple of products where you could either apply them solo or in, in um, a combined a formulation combined with um, strobulin SDHI. And that's really the end of my slides. I'm not sure if I haven't run over time. I think I did. So hopefully um, that's OK. Over to you, Wayne. Thank you, Silchuk. Uh, we are a little bit over time. So if I could just ask uh, Rachel just to sort of transition to my final slide and I'll just wrap up today's uh, presentation. Uh, but, but thank you to all our speakers, to all today's speakers for, for their inputs. Um, and hopefully, uh, uh, there we go. So if I can just thank all our speakers today, uh, Selchuk, um, Dave and, and Jude for their presentations. Um, if 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 for whatever reason you you were late joining us and you haven't submitted basis neuroso forms, please uh, drop Rachel an email and she can send those out to you. Uh, you've got a few seconds to download the handout if you haven't done so so far. There were one or two questions I'm afraid I couldn't take because of time restrictions, but if you want to submit them to me directly the next day or two, I can pass them on to the presenters and they can get back in touch. Um, the recording, as I said, will be made available uh, probably next week on the HDB website if you need to get back to it. And um, there will be uh, future HDB horticulture webinars in the pipeline. The next one is planned for the 11th of February, looking specifically at uh, aphid control. Uh, so with that, uh, good luck for the 2021 season and hopefully we can all now uh, en enjoy uh, successful control programs for pests and diseases. So thank you for that and goodbye.